Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to the session, though I know you didn't have other options this time. Um, I want to thank the uh, Mises Institute for inviting me and uh, to the donors to, for making all this possible. Uh, so I was asked to talk about the political economy of policing, uh, which, well, first, what is that? So the political economy apart, what I mean by that is the well, using our tools of economics to analyze these institutions through which policing is provided. And by policing, I mean what people typically think of as policing, right? Government agents going out and patrolling, uh, catching bad guys, eating donuts, these types of things. But in addition to that, also private actors doing things to enforce property rights, protect themselves, um, encourage public safety more generally. So I include this pretty broad definition. And really what I want to do is engage in this comparative institutional analysis, both of uh, policing provided by government bureaucracies and by um, private enterprises that can engage in economic calculation. And that's really what I see as key here, is economic calculation. I mean, to paraphrase uh, C.S. Lewis, it's the light by which I see everything else. Uh, so uh, Dr. Newman yesterday talked about uh, economic calculation or the lack thereof under socialism. And I guess I find this a helpful way of thinking about that um, comparing, compared to bureaucracy. So you mentioned under socialism, a Mises in uh, economic calculation, the socialist commonwealth, he allows markets and consumer goods and so you do have a price for outputs. So I have price for outputs with a little dollar sign there. Um, but you don't have prices for the inputs, the factors of production, because they're not privately owned, they're not traded, and so they don't have a market price. And so what do we get? Well, we don't know. It's um, calculational chaos. So for bureaucracy, usually we're talking about uh, an enterprise within an otherwise market-based order where there is private property and the means of production. Um, but for the output that the bureaucracy produces, there is no price. It it says it has no cash value on the market. This doesn't mean it doesn't have a value, but it doesn't have a monetary value that we can uh, put a price on. So for bureaucracies operating in a market economy, they do have meaningful prices for most of their inputs, and I'll put a caveat in there that I'll um, talk about in the next slide. But they don't have prices for their outputs. So when we talk about those outputs that police bureaucracies produce, um, there's no price for them. Um, they go, I do those things I mentioned, um, but they're funded through taxation. So consumers aren't able to express their willingness to pay for various police outputs. So, um, that also leads to, you know, we don't know, we're in the dark, uh, shrug. So speaking more about these prices of inputs, so, uh, you know, police departments buy various inputs, they got guns and cars and cuffs, which I don't want to say all of which have market or civilian uses, I guess, um, <laughs> where there's, you can, so they have meaningful market prices. They have to bid these away from private uses. Uh, for a lot of their inputs, you have, however, some inputs that are more specific to certain types of bureaucracies. And I plan to talk about this a lot more tomorrow, um, uh, tomorrow's talk, talking about the military industrial complex. But um, as far as policing goes, it's a, you know, these kinds of inputs are pretty standardized. There's uh, market prices for them that are meaningful. Um, labor is a bit harder. In a lot of bureaucracies, you have types of labor that are pretty comparable to a uh, voluntary sector or private sector use. So, for example, custodians, they provide a very similar service, uh, whether it's a government building or a private building. And so we have a pretty good measure of their opportunity costs. However, for government police officers, um, though uh, their skills are not, not valued on the market, but it's not as directly comparable. And so in that sense, it's not having that direct counterpart. I would say that we don't have as good of idea of how much they should be paid. And I put should in scare quotes because I'm mean, trying to be value-free here. You know, Vert Fry 
what I mean by that should is you know, the prices for factors of production tend to reflect their discounted marginal revenue product. But the problem with a bureaucracy is there is no marginal revenue product. It's just funded by taxation. And so in that sense, we don't know how much officers should be paid uh, in that sense, uh, is what I mean. And so uh, this becomes relevant when we're talking about police unions and labor law, that um, there's a little bit of fudging that can go on. Um, are they overpaid or underpaid? It's like, we don't know, because there's not an actual market for them. So laying that groundwork. So uh, there's this question, how much policing, or what kinds of policing should we buy if our goal is to um, satisfy consumer preferences according to uh, the, the best use of resources? And I have this simple little graph here. What I'm trying to show here is we have a, um, as we increase our spending on policing, on crime prevention, you know, crime goes down, but at some point, the marginal benefit is less than the marginal cost. But the big problem with bureaucracy is we don't know where that is. Uh, consumers can't demonstrate at a certain point, like, okay, this is nice, but I don't want any more of this. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so this is also relevant for bureaucracies, because most bureaucracies, they I mean, believe in the mission they're doing, say we could do uh, more good if you give us more resources. But um, we don't know at what point it's like stop um, within a bureaucracy. Um, by contrast, uh, when policing services, um, said property rights protection, et cetera, provided through voluntary means, economic calculation is possible. Um, this is true at an individual level. An individual say, um, I don't know, you go invest in a safe. You keep your stuff in there. It gives you peace of mind. You're able to compare like, you're, the value you put on the money that you give up for the safe compared to the services of the safe. I get this peace of mind. I'm willing to part with this money. Um, resources are allocated to more highly valued uses. Um, but not only at the individual level. We think of commercial enterprises purchasing security from a third party or um, providing it in-house, they're able to engage in profit and loss accounting. They can see how much, compare the monetary costs of the security versus um, the benefit that can be measured in possibly additional revenue or losses prevented or higher capital values to their business and property. So an example of this, it's, uh, so you got this guy. Um, so it, at this particular uh, gas station in Philadelphia, as you can imagine, a lot of people while pumping gas, they're getting robbed at gunpoint. This isn't good for business. So the proprietor of this gas station hires uh, this guy, he's got a rifle. Um, except, I mean, even you know, Fox News, they're like, oh, a guy with an AR-15, because they don't know their guns, um, despite ostensibly being this uh, conservative news station. But in this case, the proprietor of the gas station can compare, like, here are my losses, uh, or here was what my revenue was before I hired this guy. Here's how much it costs to hire this guy. Here are my revenues afterwards. Was this worth doing? Are resources being allocated to more highly valued uses? And so he can use economic calculation to determine uh, whether this security should or should not be provided. Um, a couple of other uh, institutional differences I want to talk about um, in regards to government policing versus policing in the private sector is that government policing generally takes place in what I'll call the public domain. Um, government streets and sidewalks, these places that don't have a capital value because they're not privately owned and traded. And so this um, hinders the ability of economic calculation to determine um, whether uh, security is worth providing. Right? If we have if you imagine instead of a gas station, maybe we have a government bus stop and we, it's not privately owned, we don't have a capital value, what's the value of providing more or less security there? Um, we're less able to tell. Further, uh, I guess the final institutional difference I want to mention is these differences in how government police are constrained versus uh, private security. So for a liberal like Mises, when he describes bureaucracy, like, you have these rules that they have to follow because they're relatively economically unconstrained. You know, they get their tax money whether or not 
uh, they're providing a good service that's valuable to people. And especially when they're you know, police officers with guns and the ability to directly deprive people of their liberty, uh, their power really needs to be constrained for uh, Mises. And I'll talk about some of the trade-offs involved in that in a little bit. So um, for most of the remainder of this talk, I want to talk about all these different trade-offs in policing. How, uh, what I want to show is how even though Mises, uh, if you're going to provide policing through a bureaucracy, it seems like, yeah, you can subject this to rules. Like, if uh, police officers see this person breaking the law, like, okay, we have established penalties for that, you know, citations or arrests and um, sentences, whatever. Um, it's, it seems on the surface that you could possibly subject this to bureaucratic decision making. But uh, I want to talk about how um, there are many trade-offs just inherent in policing, whether it's provided through bureaucracies or through private enterprise, and how without economic calculation, we're unable to know, sounds grammatically funny, we're, we can't know the optimal trade-off according to consumer preferences um, between these values. So um, I'll talk about each of these. So first one, uh, what I'll call convenience slash dignity and security. Um, as I hinted at, constitutional constraints and security. Uh, whether to use force and how much when you decide to use force. Um, a particular enforcement policy, but I'm sure you'll think of more than what I mentioned. And then the last couple have to do with um, police labor law, labor economics, um, officer protections, and taxation, and depleasing, or as we call it in the industry, shirking. So regarding this first point of convenience slash dignity and security. So one example, maybe you've encountered these guys on your way here. So I don't know, the, how does this happen to anyone? Have you gotten a scalp massage from the TSA? <laughs> like, what are they looking for? Or is this? Uh, in the ASMR trend, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I haven't yeah, gotten that treatment yet. When we think of the TSA, so, I mean, let's assume for the sake of argument, they want to find this optimal trade-off. They don't, the only reason they would uh, do undignifying things to you is to uh, increase security, not um, for any other purpose. Um, and they want to make things as convenient as possible, say. Uh, the problem is they, Again, can't know this optimal trade-off because they're this monopoly provider. If instead we could imagine, say, the airlines themselves providing this, uh, their own security, you'd have an incentive alignment. If they could compete with one another, they'd want to find this optimal trade-off because they want to attract customers by being as convenient and uh, dignifying as possible. But they also want to protect their billions of dollars in capital goods. And so through that competitive process, they would be able to determine where this optimal trade-off is. They don't, I mean, they want to make things as convenient as possible, but um, right, they also want to protect uh, their stuff. And without this competitive market process, we can't know what uh, this optimal trade-off is. Um, another example, you know, pretty similar here. So here I have a picture from a Kroger in Fulton County in uh, Georgia. It says, some customers upset over changes at a Kroger. So it, what we have here is this uh, interior barrier within the grocery store around, I guess, particular items that were prone to theft. So it looks like, um, you know, maybe your Tide Pods, uh, these types of things that, you know, people would, you know, sneak, a, sneak out with. And the reason customers are upset is like, well, we, you know, we feel like we're being treated like criminals. This, you know, is undignifying. This is less convenient if I have to go through this structure that uh, has one entrance and exit. And um, the fortunate thing here for Kroger is that they can measure the costs and benefits of this in monetary terms. They might, I mean, perhaps they lose some customers. They go elsewhere where they're better treated. But they also have the benefit of presumably reducing some of the theft. And so is this worth it? And they can determine this through uh, profit and loss accounting. Um, also similarly, here in, uh, in Baltimore we have a little convenience store, a uh, little lady behind a plexiglass wall. I mean, she has to measure how much does this wall cost? I mean, you can't just pass the cost off onto Mexico, she has to pay for this wall. And um, 
perhaps this uh, <laughs> presumably reduces theft, uh, increases her own personal safety and sense of safety. She can also measure whether this is worth um, pursuing. Um, moving on to this next topic of uh, constitutional constraints. I'm gonna quote Mises here. In bureaucracy, Mises says, if one assigns to the authorities the power to imprison or even to kill people, one must restrict and clearly circumscribe this power. The law determines under what conditions the judge should have the right and the duty to sentence and the policeman to fire his gun. So as I mentioned earlier, like, if you're going to give the state these powers and they're relatively unconstrained uh, um, by economics, then you're going to want to constrain them in a different way. But this isn't without costs. And I think um, Randy Barnett, the legal philosopher, describes this uh, dilemma, what he calls the dilemma of vulnerability well. He says, a society that includes extensive public property holdings is therefore faced with what might be called a dilemma of vulnerability. Since governments enjoy privileges denied their citizens and are subject to few of the economic constraints of private institutions, their citizens are forever vulnerable to governmental tyranny. And he goes on to say, well, if you're going to then constrain them so you reduce your vulnerability to the police, well, this comes at the cost of increasing your vulnerability to this uh, non-police uh, victimizers or harassers. Uh, so there, you face this trade-off. So uh, we can think about this in terms of I mean, order maintenance in the public domain. So it, at least in the American context, uh, laws against certain disorderly activities, such as vagrancy, loitering, panhandling, soliciting, and public intoxication have been voided for vagueness or otherwise considered unconstitutional, like um, a recent case uh, involving the city of Boise and it being appealed to the crazy uh, whatever federal circuit court California is in. Um, that uh, it's cruel and unusual to not let people camp on sidewalks, I mean, unless you uh, house them otherwise. So courts have said, yeah, police have to leave these guys alone doing these things that um, at least some of us might otherwise you know, feel unsafe around her, uh, find unsavory. Um, this does constrain the power of the police, but it also leaves people more vulnerable to whatever uh, might happen to them or be done to them by people engaging in these activities. Um, so this is that dilemma of vulnerability in uh, the public domain. Um, by contrast, when we talk about the constraints facing uh, rule enforcers on private property, um, so here I have a picture. These are the Beatles of Burlington Arcade. They got cool uniforms. They are considered one of the oldest private security forces in the world. Um, the Burlington Arcade is this upscale shopping area in London. Um, it's very you know, spiffy. Um, they enforce rules that would be considered unconstitutional to enforce in an American city. Um, in the public domain by uh, government police. So for instance, they enforce a rule against uh, whistling because at one point in time, whistling was used as this code among pickpockets. They'd uh, you know, whistle at each other and uh, steal stuff. So they prohibit that. Um, additionally, they enforce rules against making clucking noises because um, ladies of the night would uh, advertise their services by clucking. And you know, this ruins the... Uh, you know, decorum of this uh, nice, nice area. But of course, they're also constrained. They can't just, I mean, they can choose to enforce whatever rules they want, but um, economic constraints, uh, consumer preferences are going to determine which rules are worth enforcing and which aren't. If um, consumers have this high preference for clucking, uh, they're gonna go elsewhere. And so they are also subject to, um, they, the rules themselves, can be subject to um, profit and loss accounting. And this question of uh, whether to use force or how much force to use, this is an entrepreneurial decision, just like all these other decisions I've been talking about. They're all entrepreneurial. Um, and sometimes it is profit maximizing to tolerate a nuisance rather than just immediately get rid of it. So in this picture, um, we have an individual in a Philadelphia Starbucks, actually two individuals, one in the front and one in the back being arrested. Um, so they 
We're in this uh, Philadelphia Starbucks a few years ago, um, just well, sitting there. They said they were waiting to make a uh, real estate deal. Um, one of them had asked to use the bathroom, but they're like, buy something or leave, you know. Which, I'd say Starbucks, uh, the Starbucks manager is fully within her rights to do. Um, they chose to do neither, and the police were called, and these men were arrested, and um, well, that wasn't the end of the deal. This created a big uh, media brouhaha, a big uh, embarrassment for Starbucks. I think the CEO uh, personally met with these men and apologized to them. I think he might have started a scholarship in their name for uh, young entrepreneurs. Uh, they uh, closed down thousands of Starbucks for like half a day for training. Um, so this was costly for Starbucks. It was uh, an embarrassment. Um, and, uh, but it's only through profit and loss that they're able to determine like, whether this was the case. Because from the police, the, the perspective of the Philadelphia police, um, they, did, they did everything by the book. Everything went well. There wasn't really um, I mean, violence, more violence than had to be used. They just used force to remove these guys. Um, but because they were operating in this context where profit and loss calculations possible, even though they are bureaucratic police, because they're operating in this context of profit and loss within the Starbucks, we're able to determine whether this was um, a good use of force in terms of consumer preferences, and apparently it wasn't. And what's also great is that uh, you can tell when you've overcorrected. So a few years later, uh, well, apparently Starbucks got too tolerant of uh, nuisances. So there was a, a series of Starbucks closings because they tolerated uh, people shooting up drugs in the bathroom. Um, this made employees feel unsafe. It made uh, uh, as their progressive customers feel unsafe, it's like we want we want you to you know be nice to uh, the street people. We just don't want to be anywhere near them. Uh, so, in this case, we have these two trade-offs. They don't want to be too tolerant, um, as they were in uh, Seattle. But they don't want they want to be able to tolerate at least some things, as they didn't in Philadelphia. So, only through the competitive process and profit and loss are they able to find this optimal trade-off. Now I want to talk about one particular policy decision, but there's probably many we could talk about. So some police departments uh, restrict the discretion of officers to engage in high-speed pursuits because, I mean, this is a risky thing to do, all right? Um, so let's talk about some of the costs and benefits. So benefits of limiting hot pursuit, or at least limiting officers' discretion to engage in it. I guess you reduce your own liability, which is good. Uh, so lower likelihood that uh, police will cause crashes and kill someone or severely injure them. Um, you reduce this incentive to drive recklessly to evade police. Presumably, um, people are going to drive. If, if you don't chase them, then you know, they'll drive more safely. Uh, maybe you can catch them later. Um, so the intended benefits. Uh, but the, obviously, it also comes at some costs. Right? There's a lower marginal cost of breaking traffic laws if you know, uh, well, they're not going to come get me. So you might see more of that, or you will. Uh, you also have deaths of exuberance. This is, uh, I borrow this term from Steve Saylor. It's kind of the inverse of uh, deaths of despair, uh, where instead of drinking yourself to death, you like have fun to death uh, by driving fast. And um, so that's an, a potential cost if people are going to engage in more um, illegal traffic activities if police aren't going to chase them. And I mean, there's probably lots more we can th think of. I mean, there's going to be fewer entertaining police chase videos. But these aren't commensurate values. How do we determine what the optimal uh, policy decision is? And we really can't. And uh, I mean, part of this is a problem with uh, you know, police monopoly um, on the roads, but also the road monopolies themselves. Right? And um, I don't think we have time today to talk about the perverse incentives of uh, you know, using traffic enforcement as a uh, revenue generator, which is obviously a function of uh, police and road monopoly. But because, again, uh, sorry to sound like a broken record, because these don't operate in um, the domain where profit and loss calculation is possible, because there's not private property and roads and so forth, voluntary exchange and monetary prices, not able to determine what the optimal trade-off uh, in this policy is. So, 
Moving on to uh, this issue of police unions and the protections they bar bargain for. So um, police unions, they value job protections that increase their job security, but this comes at the cost of making uh, punishing police officers more difficult. And uh, well, one implication from labor economics we get from this is all else held constant. The more protections they have, the lower you have to pay them in wages. I mean, this applies to a lot of things. If, uh, say, uh, a professor considering two jobs that are all else held constant, one offers tenure, one does not, well, this one's going to be more valuable that offers tenure. So one's not offering tenure, going to all else held constant, uh, offer higher wages or some other compensating differential. And um, police know this. There's uh, some interesting examples of this. So in the city of Chicago, when, uh, I mean, the city was kind of on fiscally harder times, the police union, the Fraternal Order of Police in Chicago, negotiated for greater protections in lieu of higher wages. And um, the city accepted that. But then later, you find that the, uh, well, we have a lot of uh, police abuses. They form a, a Chicago Police Accountability Task Force. And the task force has a variety of recommendations. One of the recommendations is, is to get rid of some of these protections. These are making it harder to punish officers engaged in misconduct. And the uh, Fraternal Order of Police President says, yeah, we would be willing to do that. Just bring your checkbook. So he's, he's willing to engage in this negotiation to, yeah, we'll reduce our protections, but you got to pay us more. And so this trade-off is faced here. And maybe we could talk a little bit about the uh, incentives facing city negotiators where, I mean, this is budget neutral to them in the present of offering protections and nobody's gonna remember when the costs come due later when you have all these uh, police officers you can't fire. Um, so we tend to see that, but this leads to an interesting trade-off. I actually, oh, you know, uh, Dr. Newman talked a little bit about surveys, something I'd like to survey people on. And of course, uh, asking them about their willingness to pay probably isn't very meaningful. But in light of this trade-off, those who want police reform, like, like no, how much are you willing to pay for it? If you had to, pay, I think people assume that it's free. That is, if you paid police officers, if you had the opportunity to pay them off to get rid of their protections, how much would you be willing to pay? We don't know. I don't know. Um, and this leads to a, an interesting political economy issue is that um, Taxpayers aren't homogeneous. Uh, it tends to be the case that those who are wealthier, paying more of the taxes, are also less likely to be subject to police misconduct. So this leads me to well, speculate that maybe the, like the defund the police movement might have been, I mean, it was like this progressive thing, but maybe it was just a hidden plot to reduce taxes by uh, those who are unlikely to be uh, harassed by the police anyway. No, I'll talk a little bit more about the uh, uh, defund movement in a, near the end of this talk, but interesting thing to think about. A related trade-off is one between, or supposedly between misconduct and depleasing, that is uh, the shirking. As so um, advocates of protecting police, it's not just so they can go engage in misconduct. The ostensible goal is that um, if they're unprotected, they're not going to want to engage in proactive policing. As if they go out and try to be proactive, this increases the likelihood of maybe committing some tort that they have to pay for. Um, so I mean, think about if you were a police officer, it's like, well, if I'm unprotected, I'm going to try to do the least possible. I'm going to go hide out in my car somewhere like I see some of these Auburn police officers doing. And, and maybe that's the best for everyone. It's just to uh, leave everyone alone. Um, but they engage in shirking. This reduces their liability. So this is another trade-off. Of course, um, one reason they're able to do this is because of the lack of competition. As um, an entrepreneur um, providing security services will want to find this optimal trade-off between limiting the liability of their security agents, but also actually providing the service. Um, but if you have a monopoly situation, you know, you're uh, more able to engage in shirking and limiting liability. 
Sweet. Well, we got we got plenty of time. Wow. Um, so, I'm not going to miss the opportunity to engage in some self promotion. Uh, a fairly recently published paper, I guess last year, um, in Public Choice, was regarding this uh, issue of defunding the police. Though, I don't know, nobody seems to care anymore. But I'll give you the uh, TLDR version of uh, the paper. So, it's a mystery to me. Defunding was never very popular. So, uh, why did it happen? So, uh, our story for that is that after the death of George Floyd, a lot of progressive city leadership, they needed to, they, need, they felt the need to look like they were doing something. You know, we can't just, I mean, we got to do something, of course, right? Um, but they're pretty limited in what they can actually do. A part of it because of police unions. If they engage in certain types of reform that change police practices, well, then that will, you know, trigger that part of the union contract changing, uh, working conditions, and you'll have to go through these negotiations. And that's costly. So what they did instead was, I mean, they have some control of the budget. Of course, you can't touch uh, current wages. Those are sacrosanct. But um, you can cut hiring, which is most of what they did. And um, while th they found that this isn't really a switch you can turn on and off. Right? You can turn off, be like, yeah, we're cutting the police. But when they later turned it back on, when they refunded, that's why we have a from defunding to refunding, most, pretty much all the cities we looked at that at least committed to defunding at some point, they have since increased their budgets uh, greater to what they were before they engaged in the cutting. Um, because it was really hard to stay committed to this uh, during the summer of love when um, a number of these cities were experiencing record homicides. It's like, well, uh, you can't, it's hard to say, we're, yeah, we're gonna cut the police. Um, it didn't seem to cost most of them politically. I know some of them, like uh, one politician in Austin, I think he's now either uh, in the Texas House or the uh, US House of Representatives. So, I mean, the, I guess you can uh, you know, demonstrate your uh, progressive bona fides. Um, but it's an interesting dynamic. I know some people are trying to gaslight us into thinking this didn't happen. I mean, it did, um, but you don't hear about the rhetoric much because it was not a political winner um, for the most part except in very progressive districts. So uh, yeah, let me know if you want a copy of that. Let's see. So to conclude, uh, so we talk about in this problem with bureaucracy in terms of I mean, trying to specify rules. This is really um, unwieldy when you're facing legitimate uh, entrepreneurial issues of uncertainty and how to best provide uh, services. Uh, like I said, it's, on the surface, it seems like something you could subject to specifying rules that officers have to follow. And that's probably the best you can do given the institution of bureaucracy. But it's not without costs. And so when we move police, policing outside the realm of economic calculation, outside of voluntary exchange, private property, and money prices, um, this contributes to many of these issues we see. Of, um, I mean, these trade-offs are inherent, but when policing is provided bureaucratically, like, we don't know what that optimum is. And I mean, not saying I mean, you necessarily want to find that optimum, but if your goal is to allocate resources according to their most highly valued uses, then the only way to do that is to provide these, uh, these services through markets. And a big implication that this has for police reform is that if you're going to engage in reform but keep the bureaucracy, if it just change the rules, um, that'll put you along a different point along these trade-offs, but it still doesn't, you don't know whether you're uh, reaching a more optimum point. And so you'll um, forever remain in the dark while you maintain this uh, bureaucratic structure of providing policing. And that's all I have to say, thank you. Hello, thank you for, for coming. My question would be the following. What uh, books or sources would you recommend on uh, private substitution of um, security services uh, in, while well, in substitution for state uh, security provision? 
in terms of policing, um, security guards, and all of that? Oh, sure. So the question was, what um, reading sources would I recommend on this subject of private security provision, um, et cetera? Uh, it's quite a lot. Jeez. Um, I guess you could yeah, go to my website and look at the uh, bibliography. No. Um, I would say some of the resources that I found very helpful um, are Bruce Benson in particular. I believe his books are for sale in the uh, bookstore. Um, particularly the enterprise of law um, to serve and protect and various uh, papers he's written on uh, also uh, on the question of road privatization and uh, private security um, of course from a I mean theoretical point you, know, you have Rothbard David Freeman uh, Bob Murphy also has some interesting perspectives on this um, and I'd say just kind of snowball from there, like look at what they're referencing and um, find a lot to read as a, I keep that short. In the uh, summer of 2020, when the Black Lives Matter protests uh, were happening, the common claim, the common retort to the idea that they were rioting, that it was, you know, it was bad to tear down, tear down businesses was that they were all insured. Now, obviously this is a little ridiculous. But my question is, do you know how much insurance actually did pay out in the wake of, you know, this, you know, destruction of cities? No. <laughs> ah. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, kind of just a, a question that I have. You kind of alluded to this in your Philadelphia example. If I'm correct, that specific situation was coming during the whole George Floyd situation. So the reason why Starbucks went did, did all of that uh, effectively went all progressive was because they were receiving public pressures too. So one thing that the market is definitely susceptible to uh, the ideological winds of a society at the time. So if you have private security, would they have booted those guys out of there as opposed to a bureaucracy that would do that even though the bureaucracy can be ideologically captured, it might be less susceptible since they do have all those rules to follow? Yeah, so I believe that event happened in 2017, these two individuals being arrested. And so to be clear, I mean, this I mean, was done at the behest of Starbucks, right? And um, I'm calling that an entrepreneurial error. And they only know it was an entrepreneurial error because of profit and loss. So you're Questions: Would bureaucracies be less susceptible yes, to ideological wins? Yeah. Man, guess if ideological wins, if we're to distinguish those from, say, consumer preferences, say uh, yes. But if those ideological whims are the whims of those in the bureaucracy and who they want to please, then. Um, well, then they are less constrained in, and, and if those diverge from consumer preferences, then they're less constrained in uh, indulging in them. So, so it depends on the context a bit. Is that, yeah. Are Just there any uh, historical examples oh. of free policing or like a free market in, uh, security and how have they gone? I guess. See it. See it. Are there yes. any historical examples of a, like a free market in uh, private security and how have they uh, played out? So a completely free market in security without any uh, government intervention. Um, yeah, I'd recommend again reading uh, Benson's histories. He writes about um, say medieval England before you had an established government police force. Very interesting example. Um, I mean, David Friedman talks about uh, Iceland and their kind of anarchic society and the, uh, the rules they have. Because, you know, it's what my research interests have been in, like, contemporary private security, which obviously operates in a uh, constrained environment, um, not fully free market, not, uh, I mean, competing on different margins, usually, from uh, government police bureaucracies. But I, I'd say start with those. There's some um, examples I'm more familiar with, though there are likely much, many more out there. 
yeah yeah i'm wondering yeah i'm wondering if you have uh advice or recommendations for how to communicate these ideas to uh perhaps law and order conservative types who fail to realizing the conf- sort of realize the conflicting incentives in their ideas um you know I'm, I'm sure most of us in this room actually would really like law and order uh but the the view of how to get there is is so much different you know what i mean yeah it's similar yeah thinking about this what what i find funny so um Maybe you're familiar with a, a friend of mine, uh, Corey DeAngelis. You know, he's a school choice guy. You're familiar? With. Uh, he wrote a, an interesting paper in the in the Libertarian Papers with, that he called "Police Choice." And what I've been uh, I lately astounded by is how much, like re- well, even rhetorically, but how similar these issues are. It's like uh, talking about schools, the government schools, and government police. Or if, I, you can essentially just do a control find and replace and have a lot of it be the same as, well, maybe people are like, well, if you get rid of public schools, government schools, how are kids gonna get educated? You're like, are they getting educated now? Um, and I'd say the same thing with government police. Like, oh, if you get rid of the police, how are poor gonna you know, stay safe? Like, are they safe now? You know, um, so I'd say, yeah, look at what you're actually receiving. I mean, there seems to be a gap between like, how idealized government policing operates in our minds uh, versus what's actually um, received. And I think in recent years with, a, uh, like during COVID, what police were willing to enforce, um, especially at the federal level, though, I guess, well, yeah, I don't know what the current state of opinion among conservatives about the FBI is probably at an all-time low, but uh, much lower than it used to be. But just seeing how ideologically opposed these law enforcement agencies are to their ways of life, I think um, it's gotten bad enough to an extent where a lot of uh, conservatives might be more willing to uh, hear criticisms of the police. Um, so I think that, I, mean, I guess that's the uh, rhetorical uh, aspect I take, like, look at how, look at the services you're actually receiving and how they are um, a threat to your way of life. They're not actually on your side. Yeah. Just one last question. Do you think that private security may have a tendency to use excessive force and excessive violence when enforcing um, their uh, property rights or may have a tendency to exacerbate their use of violence almost outside or in the water of their property rights? I'd say, I mean, what we want, it's like compared to what, right? That's what you want to ask. The question you always want to ask um, when doing a comparative institutional analysis. So I'd say compared to government police, no. Um, you, so this isn't to say that private security never makes mistakes. I mean, part of economic calculation is backward looking. Like, did we make the right decision? And adjusting, it's not like perfect foresight. Um, But there are costs to using excessive force as private security that don't exist for government police. um, There isn't qualified immunity. Um, People can leave. (laughs) They don't have to keep paying you tax money. And so um, this isn't to say that private security doesn't make mistakes but that there are costs that exist and therefore a greater incentive to correct after the fact. So so I want to say it's not that it doesn't happen, but it's um, much less likely and much more likely to be corrected. Thank you.